Welcome to the Drake Group's webinar series on critical issues in collegiate athletics. Today's discussion, college athletes' freedom of speech and expression, or the lack thereof. Our moderator is Sandy Thatcher, former director of the Penn State University Press and a member of the Drake Group Board of Directors. Welcome to all of you who have chosen to view this webinar, which uh, I look forward to myself because I am still learning a whole lot about this area of the law in application to sports um, and, and very much learned from all of the uh, panelists here uh, who have written articles about them. And uh, those articles will be mentioned and linked to from in the notes that we distribute after this uh, discussion. So uh, I, 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 we announced uh, certain topics that would be covered in this uh, webinar. And uh, I, th I think all of them will be covered, but perhaps there will not be much said unless people raise questions about it with regard to uh, use of abusive language by athletes themselves. But I should point out that the way in which I got interested in this whole subject of free speech as it relates to athletics was through uh, an incident at uh, Princeton University where the uh, athletic department decided to cancel the uh, season for the men's swimming team because of abusive language, misogynistic, racist, homophobic, and so forth, um, used by members of the team uh, in reference to the members of the women's team. And Interestingly, uh, that same phenomenon happened at other colleges like Amherst, Columbia, and Harvard with respect to other men's teams, wrestling, cross country, soccer, and those seasons were also canceled in, in response to that kind of behavior uh, online. I, I should point out that all of those colleges are private colleges and the First Amendment does not apply in the same way to those colleges. So the abusive language used there, which ha had it been used in a public university setting, might have been challenged in court. There, there were no legal challenges to what those universities did. And uh, I should also mention that uh, as, as the time has gone on since then, I do not know of any other repetitions of that kind of behavior. So maybe the uh, position paper which we put out, which focused on that kind of behavior uh, as, as a basis for what we had to say at that point in time when the paper came out in 2018, maybe it had its effect and people decided not to engage in that behavior uh, afterwards. So anyway, that's a little background just to show that if you're wondering why we're not covering that, it is a topic covered thoroughly in our Drake position paper which you can find at the Drake website. Um, let me just very briefly, before I introduce the other panelists, uh, say a little bit more about my background. Uh, my introduction to First Amendment law really comes through my career in academic publishing, which covered 45 years at two university presses. In the mid 1980s, I served on the uh, Freedom to Read Committee of the Association of American Publishers I was also serving on copyright committee at the same time. And in 1985, the Supreme Court considered a case called Harper and Roe versus the nation, which had to do with the nation's uh, printing a portion of President Gerald Ford's uh, book um, about, uh, about his tenure as president, but particularly about his pardon of Nixon. And the, the court in that case favored copyright law over First Amendment law. So it was an interesting uh, outcome for, for First Amendment in that case. But that's, that was my exposure to it before the whole episode at Princeton happened in 2017, which is when I joined the uh, Drake Group as a member of its uh, board of directors. I should also say that um, I learned about the Drake Group from one of its co-founders um, named Alan Sack, and I, Alan Sack and I had interacted earlier at Penn State Press when we published this book for him in 2008 called Counterfeit Amateurs. And already he was nine years into his involvement with the Drake Group. And we will honor Alan as co-founder of the Drake Group at a 
symposium in Washington, D.C. on May 19th. And you can find more information about that at our website. And I hope uh, some of you at least will consider coming to that uh, symposium, helping to honor uh, Alan and uh, be uh, engaged in some very, very interesting panel discussions that will be led by uh, people like Bob Costas and uh, Catherine Brennan. So uh, I invite you to go to our website and look for that information. Now, uh, to introduce our other panelists in the order in which they will be speaking, first of all, uh, Kaya McCullough. Uh, in an article about her in the Daily Beast in September 2021, the reporter observed that McCullough has never been one to remain silent throughout her amateur and professional career. McCullough has called out injustice and inequities, particularly in women's sports and particularly when they affect athletes of color. Kaya began making waves when she refused to pledge allegiance to the flag as a sophomore in high school after the protests in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. As a sophomore in the soccer team at UCLA in 2017, she got mad when President Trump made a culture war villain out of Colin Kaepernick. So she decided uh, to start kneeling while the national anthem was being played at games. Uh, later on, while playing for the pro soccer team, the Washington Spirit, she called out the coach for his abusive treatment of her and other players and quit the team in protest with the coach eventually being fired as a result. The Daily Beast notes that she co-founded United College Athlete Advocates, a nonprofit that advocates for college athletes' rights. Their goal, McCullough said, is to help athletes organize and hopefully alter the power dynamics between athletes and their de facto employer, the NCAA. Although that organization has ceased to exist, Kaya told me, she is determined to devote her life to fighting social injustice racial injustice through representing nonprofits in this space as an attorney. And toward that end, she will be starting Harvard Law School in the fall. Our second speaker, Josephine Petuto, who prefers to be called Joe, is the Richard A. Larson Professor of Constitutional Law at the University of Nebraska, where she has been since 1974, the year she received her JD degree from Rutgers Law School. Along the way um, to that degree, she earned degrees in journalism and English literature. Uh, <coughs> and uh, her areas of expertise include, besides constitutional law, federal jurisdiction, mass communications, civil procedure, contract law, criminal law, and not least, sports law. She is the faculty athletic representative of the University of Nebraska to the NCAA and has served on several NCAA committees including the Committee on Infractions, which she chaired from 2006 to 2008, and the Men's Gymnastics Championship Committee. <clears throat> Next speaker will be Frank Lamonte, who began his career <clears throat> as an investigative reporter and political commentator for Florida newspaper, um, then worked for a while in an Atlanta law firm, then served as executive director of the Student Press Law Center in Washington, D.C., and finally into academe at the University of Florida, where he has served as director of the Breckner Center for Freedom of Information and professor of media law doing research on the public right of access to information. He is the founding editor of the Journal of Civil Information and the executive producer of the award-winning podcast, Why Don't We Know?, which focuses on secrecy in the education sector. Finally, uh, Sam Ehrlich, who's holder of both the JD and PhD degrees, is Assistant Professor of Legal Studies in the Department of Management at Boise State University. Before entering academe, Sam worked as a sports agent consultant and an immigration lawyer. His current research focuses on the legal governance of sports by way of examining athletes' employment rights, sports-specific antitrust exemptions, and tort and constitutional liability for overseeing athletic organizations. So those, those are the well-informed speakers from which you will be hearing shortly. Um, I have just a few additional introductory remarks before we go on to their presentations. 
and this is by way of, of giving you some basic um, lay of the land type of guidance here, which is what I learned in the process of, of reading articles by our professor panelists and doing some other research. So um, a Harvard law, Civil Rights Law and Civil Liberties Law Review article that I recently read begins this way. If you want to confuse a room full of law students, teach them First Amendment doctrine. Courts have struggled over the years to develop consistent jurisprudence, instead creating what Robert Post, a former dean of the Yale Law School, described as a vast Sardasso sea of drifting and entangled values, theories, rules, exceptions, predilections. So this is no less the case for the First Amendment as applied and interpreted to the more specific limited domain of college athletics. But from the reading I did in my preparation for this webinar, which includes those articles I, I referenced, um, I did, did learn a, a few basic things. First of all, the Supreme Court applies what it is called strict scrutiny, the highest level of judicial review, to regulations that are directed at content or viewpoint. And even though content and viewpoint neutral rules are favored by the courts, uh, it is clear that when content or viewpoint are involved, courts are most inclined to question regulation of speech that limits discussion of issues of political or general public concern compared with commercial speech or speech related only to individual grievances or interests. Uh, highly offensive speech of the kind we might label as hate speech or even the kind involved in the season cancellations by the private college that I mentioned earlier could also come in for strict scrutiny if it does not verge into outright illegal speech like defamation. Second point is where regulation is done by restrictions on time, place, and manner, courts are inclined to take this into account as a mitigating factor, even when strict scrutiny is applied and, and be more accepting of regulation uh, in that way. Uh, third, because they are considered institutions of the state, public colleges and universities are legally bound to respect students' constitutional rights as defined by the First Amendment, whereas private colleges and universities are not. However, uh, even private institutions, to quote from FIRE, which is the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, have traditionally viewed themselves and sold themselves as bastions of free thought and expression. Accordingly, private colleges and universities should be held to the standard that they themselves establish. Uh, moreover, they are contractually bound to respect the promises they make to students. Uh, yet if they wish to place a particular uh, set of moral, philosophical, or religious teachings above a commitment to free speech, they have every right to do so. Fourth, most of the case law about free speech exercised in an educational setting has been developed in reference to K-12 to uh, level education, including the landmark Tinker decision in 1969 that ruled in favor of high school students whose parents had sued after the students had been expelled for wearing black armbands in protesting the Vietnam War. From that case uh, stemmed the criteria by which schools can justify limiting uh, or banning speech in reference to, quote, substantial disruption or material interference with school activities. Uh, the assumption among scholars and judges appears to be that the Tinker criteria may apply less strictly, if at all, to free speech and expression in the college setting. Uh, finally, by virtue of the volunteering to participate in sports, which are governed by lots of rules, athletes are regarded as being more subject to regulation than our students in general. There are differences among courts as to how integral sports are considered to be as part of the school's educational mission, and probably that is more so true at the K-12 than at the college level. And finally, social media, because they enable reaching wide audiences, pose special challenges to coaches and athletic administrators who want to control 
what athletes say off campus, but they also amplify free speech opportunities that are valuable to athletes in their capacity as students also. Um, one additional thing I learned from uh, reading about law in this context is also true for what I learned uh, in learning about copyright law and especially fair use cases is that the, the outcomes of cases uh, in the courts are highly de dependent on the particulars of the factual circumstances involved, which makes predicting the outcomes um, a challenge even for experts sometimes. So that's kind of the basic lay of the land and you, you will get more details from our speakers as we move on. And I will call on Kaya first to talk about her experience at uh, UCLA and uh, how she engaged in political protests, what the reaction was and what she feels need, still needs to be done. So Kaya, you're up. Hi everybody, um, so nice to be here. Thanks to the Drake Group for having me on. It's really a blessing to be in the presence of such great legal scholars. I'm really excited to start my own law career, so this is really exciting for me. Um, I A little bit of background <laughs> to get to the point of where I started my protest in college. I grew up in Orange County, California. Uh, for anybody who knows that area, it's a very conservative, very predominantly white area and I grew up there as a young biracial black woman. And so I was no stranger to sort of existing outside the status quo. Growing up throughout my adolescence in high school, I know um, it was mentioned that I guess I started my, my protest of, um, you know, the national anthem, or not the national anthem, the Pledge of Allegiance in the high school when I was a sophomore. And it really just was as simple as me not feeling like I could pledge allegiance to a flag that was representing so many things that I disagreed with. And, you know, the main thing for that protest was the liberty and justice for all bit I just didn't agree with. And I began by not saying it in high school and then I began by just not standing up for it and it definitely caused a lot of friction in my Orange County High School um, with some of my peers and with some teachers. Um, so I think that was really the groundwork for how I started my you know journey into political protest. It seems very small but it did have a very profound impact on me and when I joined the UCLA women's soccer team as a freshman, you know, it was, it was pretty quiet. I was adjusting to, to how to be a college student, how to play on a division one team at the highest level and really just figure out how to be an adult on my own. Um, so as soon as my sophomore year started, I was really taken with Colin Kaepernick's story of kneeling in the NFL um, I agreed with all his reasoning and I really saw the way in which that his expression was able to get his point across. Um, I know it was very controversial in the media at the time and it still is to this day, but for me, it really resonated with me, his reasoning, his choice of action. And I decided really spontaneously, to be honest, that I was also going to kneel in solidarity with his protest. And as far as I know, it's one of the first instances of that in college sports, specifically kneeling for the national anthem. Um, I was 19 years old. I was a sophomore at UCLA. So this was back in 2017. And how it happened was I called my mom and I pretty much was like, I'm going to start kneeling for the anthem. I really don't care about the consequences for it. I don't know how it's going to be taken, but I'm going to do it. I've I've resolved, I'm going to do it. And then from there, I contacted my coach at the time, Amanda Cromwell. Um, she's now coaching professionally in my former professional league. So, um, and I was like, hey, I really want to have a conversation with you. It's about kneeling. And she set up a meeting for the next day after practice. And really, I just sat down with her and my assistant coach, Sam Green, and we had a discussion about what was happening at the time in the media with kneeling and Colin Kaepernick, um, how kneeling made me feel, why I felt it was important for me 
And I then from there, we decided that we were going to bring the conversation to the rest of the team. And again, we had a conversation and we sat down the whole team. I expressed my viewpoints on it, why it was important to me. And we sort of collaborated as a team to be able to figure out the best way to move forward with it. Obviously, not everybody was required to kneel. We definitely made it an option for people to express how they wanted to. Some people joined me, some people didn't, but we collaborated as a team to develop a way to show solidarity, no matter what choice you're making. Um, at the time it was, while people were kneeling, teammates would have their, their arm on their shoulder just so it all looked like we were unified. And from there, it just sort of took off and I continued kneeling throughout my college career. Um, so all the way through 2019 when I graduated as a senior. And then I also continued kneeling into my professional career. And from there, it sort of spiraled into just seeing the power of protest and got a lot of media attention. There were articles um, in TMZ with people, you know, saying racial slurs about me in articles, um, but there also was a lot of support. And so I think I wouldn't be talking in this webinar today if I didn't make the choice to kneel as a 19 year old. Um, I think it definitely opened my, my eyes to the power of political protest and the power of collective action. And I honestly attribute that to my current path of wanting to pursue law school. And um, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty much background on, on how that whole incident happened. I think you're on mute, sorry. Thanks very much, Kaya. Uh, I, I'm glad to have that example of real life uh, protest and, and the reaction to it as, as background. Um, uh, Joe has written a lot about the ways in which colleges have attempted to um, limit the behavior and speech of, of athletes in various contexts. And um, she, at one point toward the end of the article of hers I read about this, said that she thought that under certain circumstances, colleges could actually um, uh, have a constitutional right to uh, to prevent athletes from kneeling. Uh, not that that's a solution that she prefers herself, but she, in her understanding of the, of the law is that it, it might in, in, in certain ways be permissible to do that. So uh, Joe, if you would go ahead and, and sort of lay out the, 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 the ways in which the constitution works in this respect, uh, please go ahead. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for inviting me and thanks, Sandy. You did a phenomenal job of organizing. Um, I'm going to do what I would consider to be a roadrunner tour, those of you who know the cartoon, through aspects of the First Amendment, because to do it in any depth that I would really capture this subject area would take all of us several hours. So mine is going to be highlights and therefore the nuances are going to be left. And uh, I just don't want anybody to hear this and think this is somebody who teaches constitutional law and doesn't know there's more to it than that, uh, particularly if this is recorded. Um, I, the uh, First Amendment to me has an is a can and a should aspect to it. And what I'm going to be talking about some is the is part of it. Uh, this is really kind of a truism if you think about it. The only time the First Amendment is ever in play is when you have an unpopular speaker or unpopular speech. When we like the speech or we like the speaker, there's never any controversy, never any discussion. So the only time we look at this is when we're looking at um, right, the right of people that we may not like or the right of speech that we may not like. A fundamental underpinning, maybe the fundamental underpinning of the First Amendment is the suspicion of government as regulator of speech, no matter what the speech and the history of suppression or oppression of speakers and speech from, you know, you can name the country and you can name the century uh, is apt reason for the suspicion. So the Supreme Court efforts over time has been to capture and restrict the opportunity of government to regulate speech. Um, the, the biggest uh, bulwark uh, to government 
regulation of speech. The best protection is the neutral principle, which essentially says if government is going to regulate speech, let's say of A, who wants to speak for pro-choice, government has to similarly regulate B, who wants to speak for pro-life. And that obligation to be even-handed um, pretty much ties the hands of the government in, in many ways when it, when it chooses or, or it's, it's inclined to think it wants to regulate. But the fact that government has to be even-handed doesn't explain or describe when it is the government has the authority or the opportunity to regulate. Um, with regard to citizen speech, and that's what we typically are thinking of when we think of the First Amendment, uh, the court started uh, dealing with it depending on the forum. And Sandy, you said this, this that there's a quoted someone who said it's a morass. And part of the reason is the original articulation of how uh, government was going to be restricted in the speech comes from his historical background and doesn't adapt very well to all the new types of media and the new new ways that speakers can speak. Uh, but essentially, a public forum, that is, you know, the public space, the, the public square, uh, is where the First Amendment protections are in full swing. Uh, and uh, the, the corollary, the, the, the listener who may not want to hear the speech in a public square has the right to just walk away. The speaker's rights are predominant there. Government can say you can't block the sidewalks. Government can say after nine o'clock, you can't have a rally. It might be able to say you can't leaflet. Those are time, manner, place restrictions. They operate neutrally on everybody. But just being a government entity or a government space doesn't mean you're a public forum for speech purposes. You can have an office building, you can have a courthouse, and indeed you can have a football stadium or a soccer arena or a basketball arena. None of those are public forums for speech. They're not designed, they're not created, they're not, they were not historically used for people to have discussion about issues. Now that's not to say that at those stadia, there aren't people making noise and speaking, but their prime purpose there is not the speaking, it's to watch the event um, that's being, that, that, that's uh, the game that's being played. Government also, and I know other speakers on the panel are gonna get to this, also operates as its own speaker. Obviously, government makes policy all the time and it doesn't have to be even-handed. It would be absurd to say, if you're gonna say you have to stop on a red light, you also have to have policy that says you have to go on a red light. light. The public makes, government makes policy choices about, uh, about what it's gonna promote, what it's gonna do. And in line with that, it is entitled to have speech promoting the policy choice it's making. Now, obviously, government doesn't speak. If anybody here today thinks it's heard the United States government or the state of Nebraska speak, I do think you probably need to seek some sort of help somewhere. Not for me, but somewhere. Government only speaks for, for sp people. So the line as to when it is that somebody might be speaking for the government and therefore no even-handedness is necessary when that person is speaking on her own dime and may be regulated and when it is that the regulation could occur and what the regulation will be is where a lot of the, the action in the First Amendment happens. Government acts with people in ways other than government to citizen. It's government to student in terms of schools. It's government to military people in terms of the military. It's government to employees. And in those areas, government has more authority to regulate their particular tech that define what the government can do and how it can do it. Um, so let me now look at a particular example, and that would be the, the uh, uh, kneeling at the anthem uh, during a football game at a state university. Um, it's only, and, and all of these cases, or every time the court looks at this, it's fact not only fact-ridden, but factor-ridden as to all the things that are considered. But it's only a short, time. It's not as though it's encompassing the three hours or four hours that somebody is in the stadium. Uh, on the other hand, kneeling at the national anthem has no part of why student or coach is on the, on the field and no part of any team, uh, any requirement with regard to what the, what the team does in terms of play. And however small the time is, it's a captive audience. The people who have bought the ticket 
are not free in the way the person at the public uh, public space does to move off and do something else with their time. Uh, the, um, on, the, on the other side of it, the student who is uh, required to stand for the national anthem is in some ways participating in speech, and Kaya talked about this, speech that she doesn't endorse, promote, or agree with. So that student also has a speech interest in here. I do believe that, I don't think there's much question that the government, if it so cho chose, could regulate. Uh, whether the regulation could be to sanction the student for not standing, I think is much more arguable. But to say you don't need to come out until after the anthem is played certainly seems to me to be a regulation that would be upheld, uh, either for the, the student involved or to say the entire team will come in after the anthem. So I don't want to take too much time here. We're on the time frame. That's why I said Roadrunner. But let me quote Voltaire. I may not agree with what you say, but I will defend the, to the death your right to say it. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, I'll defend to the death your right to say it wherever you want to, or however you want to, or whenever you want to. Uh, and those are the questions that are left with regard to uh, speech. Uh, I do say, and Sandy said this, that I think the policy question, the should, is a far cry from the is. We know what the is is, and the is predicts the can. But what we should do and how we should try to balance the, the interests, uh, I think is obviously a very different question. And it's one that I think policymakers need to think seriously about. So thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, I think that uh, just underlines the fact that these, these cases are so much dependent on particular facts and circumstances that apply to each different case. So. Um, at, towards the end of the article you wrote, uh, which I read, uh, you, you, you talk a little bit about social media and the way that universities are uh, concerned for various reasons to try to limit or control athlete behavior because, for instance, they're worried that athletes might say something that would violate NCAA rules. They're concerned that the athletes might say something that could potentially harm their own future careers, their job prospects. So there's kind of paternalistic thing going on here. They're concerned about how uh, social media posts might reflect badly on the reputation of the university and so forth. So there's a lot of reasons that uh, universities and coaches are concerned about social media. And that is the topic that uh, Frank will now address. Uh, and so Frank, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, Sandy. And Joe, thank you for laying that perfect foundation of kind of First Amendment 101 so everybody knows the playing field that we are on to keep with the sports metaphor. Um, and then I guess the question then becomes, knowing what we now know about the law of the First Amendment, how might those principles change when we're not talking about the steps of the courthouse or Central Park, but we're talking about virtual speech online inside of the confines of a college athletic program, do the rules change and should they change so that a government institution would have more authority over that online athlete speech than we would normally entrust a government agency with if you were walking through the park on a Saturday or not, right? I think that's the, the big question. So to get to this answer, Sandy, by a roundabout way, I should say, so first of all, by the way, disclaimer that anything that I say here is personal uh, speech to myself and uh, not on behalf of any employer or institution. And so I should be careful about that since I actually work inside of higher ed. Um, the, um, the way that I got to my interest in this subject was um, as a person who has both been a journalist and been a legal advisor to journalists, I, I asked when I took over my job as a researcher at the Breckner Center, you know, what, what are your pain points? What are the things that are most interfering with your ability as a journalist to do your job effectively? And, and to a person, what people would say back to me is, well, well, nobody that I cover will talk to me anymore. They're all terrified of being punished or retaliated against for what they say because institutions are so aggressively protective of their own image and reputation. Sandy, getting to one of the justifications that you just alluded to. And it is that kind of obsessive reputation consciousness that is the driving factor behind so much of the policy making and regulation that we encounter in the space of athletics. And I want to talk in a second about 
reputation and image as a justification for overriding the freedom of speech. But um, so my, my first foray into this was really looking at these what we call gag rules, gag policies that forbid college athletes from speaking to the news media about anything and everything without permission from an athletic department. Um, we did some research, we looked at about 60 different handbooks and manuals for athletic departments around the country. And what we found is that almost 90% of those handbooks explicitly, expressly say, no one is allowed to speak to the news media, period, the end, about anything without permission from the athletic director. Didn't say during the time that your sport is in season, didn't say about secrets or confidential information that you learn within the athletic department. It was unlimited. If you wanted to talk during the off season about your grandmother's Thanksgiving turkey stuffing recipe, you were still forbidden from doing that under threat of disciplinary action by the institution. And those of you who know any First Amendment law, right away, you're, you're hearing these four, four alarm fire uh, uh, bells going off in your head called overbreath, right? Uh, uh, overbreath is always fatal to a government regulation of speech and any regulation that says you can't talk anytime, anywhere without permission of the government is going to need a very, very compelling justification or else it will be unconstitutional. Um, so so we, we did some research on that. We sort of looked at, well, in what way would a public university justify exerting almost total control over the speech of athletes in a way that we would never accept out of any other government agency. And I think you can look at it a couple of different ways. Perhaps, right, the agency might justify the regulation on the basis that, uh, well, the, these people are employees. They're, they're just like employees. And therefore, we have the employee level of control over their speech. Well, you don't have to look very far before you realize that the uh, Supreme Court and the lower courts have overwhelmingly said that even in the employment context, you don't surrender all your free speech rights at the door. You retain significant free speech protection to talk to the press and the public about things that you learn in the confines of your work. Um, the 1995 Supreme Court case, National Treasury Employees is the leading case there where the court struck down a prohibition on federal employees uh, taking uh, honorarium for, for public speaking saying, well, you can't have a prior restraint across a broad swath of public employees that goes too far. It violates their First Amendment rights. And so um, if athletes were indeed employees, and we could talk, I hope we will, about the movement to have athletes legally declared to be employees, but if they were indeed employees, then there is no First Amendment justification for forbidding them from speaking to the public writ large, right? Well, maybe they're not employees. Maybe they're college students instead. Perhaps that's the justification for colleges to exert control. Well, we know from decades of case law, starting with, Sandy alluded to the Mary Beth Tinker's case in 1969, where the Supreme Court said, just like public employees don't check their free speech rights at the door, nor do students check their free speech rights at the door. And in fact, you know, any college, imagine, envision that a college said to its, uh, I've got 35,000 students here on my campus in Gainesville. Imagine that college told all 35,000 students, um, don't be on Twitter without our permission and don't speak to the press without our permission. Uh, uh, we would have no difficulty at all seeing that that was an overbroad regulation that couldn't possibly be enforced under the First Amendment, right? So I think either viewing college athletes as employees or viewing college athletes as students, we would know that the answer is they have significant free speech protections that a public institution can't take away. And so the only way that you could get to the, the level of control that athletic departments exert over their athletes to be constitutional is to recognize some kind of diminished category of speaker that is beneath the category of student, beneath the category employees so that you have essentially zero First Amendment protection. And, and I would say uh, uh, maybe beneath the category of prison inmate as well, because there are uh, uh, substantial First Amendment protections that even apply inside of jails and prisons that can't be taken away. Um, and so uh, uh, only, only if we recognize athletes as a class of speaker that has First Amendment rights inferior to those of people inside maximum security prisons, could we get to where the current regime of control is defensible constitutionally? Um, 
Let me just talk a second about justifications, right? Because in First Amendment land, that's often all the marbles, right? If the government has an especially compelling justification, then they could do anything, right? Uh, if it's if lives are going to be lost, you know, national security is going to be compromised, then the government gets to regulate a whole lot, right? But the two primary justifications that college athletic departments always point to in justifying their restrictions of speech, whether that is don't talk to the media or don't be on social media, are first the image and reputation of the institution itself, and second, the image and reputation of the individual athlete, the speaker. Again, I would invite you to sort of telescope back and think outside the realm of college athletics and imagine yourself in any other interaction with the government other than college sports, where the government says, we are going to stop you from speaking to protect your own reputation against the adverse consequences of your poor judgment. We know, right, that that slam dunk do not pass go, do not collect $200 on constitutional, right? No way the government gets to regulate you for your own good because they know better than you what you should be saying, right? Similarly, imagine the government saying, you might damage the reputation of the government by your speech. And in order to protect the reputation of the government, we must make sure that you cannot be heard. Well, guys, that's why we threw the tea in the heart. Right. I mean, that's why we have the Bill of Rights. It's why we have the First Amendment is specifically to be able to damage the reputation of the government. That is not a bug. It is a feature. It is exactly what the First Amendment is designed to enable and empower people to do. And you know, we, we see in cases like the, 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 the Jordan McNair tragedy at University of Maryland that the ability to speak or the fear of speaking can really be an issue of physical safety. Um, if you're not familiar with the Jordan McNair story, a football player who died of heat stroke uh, during a practice at University of Maryland, and it came to light after his death was investigated, that there was this sort of a toxic culture within the football program where people knew that abuses were going on, knew that conditions were unsafe, but they were fearful of speaking out because of the culture that the program cultivated. At my school, years and years of abuse went on of women's basketball players finally came to light, not because any current players complained, because they were all too terrified, because former players and their parents complained after they felt safe from doing so because they were free from the specter of retaliation. And so the inability of athletes to blow the whistle, whether that is on social media or by speaking to the news media, is truly a safety issue and should be recognized as such. And the fact that we've got these proliferation of abuse scandals, Michigan State, Ohio State, the list goes on, that have only come to light decades belatedly after people felt safe blowing the whistle when they were free from retaliation should tell us that we've created an overly oppressive climate within these athletic departments where whistleblowers are just too fearful to tell us about the hazards that they're facing. Um, so let me stop there. I've taken up a lot of time and I'm happy to. I really do want to talk about the employer employee thing and the NLRB and the private sector as well, because we focused on the First Amendment and the public sector. But the NLRB and that National Labor Relations Act kick in when you're in a private institution like a Northwestern or a Duke or a Notre Dame. And it'd be fun to get into that a little bit as well. Well, we will do that. Thanks very much, Frank. Um, I did read an article that was written in 2014 in which the uh, author of the article, thinking about the time, place, and manner restriction, proposed that maybe the solution would be to ban use of social media during the playing season for the particular sport and banning it entirely during that period of time. But then it, it occurred to me, look, that was well before we all became familiar with the acronym NIL. And uh, so it makes no sense at all to, to seemingly ban uh, an athlete's opportunity to benefit from licensing the name, image, and likeness during the whole part of the, the year when the athlete is most visible. So this whole discussion about NILs, which uh, bring us into the realm of commercial speech, or something that uh, Sam uh, and his co-author of a paper published in the Columbia Journal of Law and the Arts uh, has written about very, very uh, uh, admirably. And so I turn it over to Sam to enlighten us about that new sector that has entered into this discussion. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much, Sandy. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the entire great group, great group for having me. Um, really appreciate this panel. And uh, I'm glad that you know, the, it was seeing that, you know, this, this research that, uh, you know, my, myself and my co-author Neil Turner, who I do see in the audience. So feel free to ask him questions too. Uh, 
Uh, I'm really glad to see that our research is kind of you know, getting getting seen in this way. And I think it's a really compelling kind of comparison, just like Sandy just made to, and, and you know, as, as Frank and Joe and Kai were talking about, looking at the kind of this new, this new sector of free speech for athletes, this new sector of athletes' rights as it relates to name, image, and likeness, which of course started in July of 2021. So we're bit, not even a year into this yet, and we still have some really interesting questions uh, about the scope of NIL, um, the, the ability for, for schools to regulate NIL, and uh, I'm definitely happy to lend to that conversation. I do want to echo Frank's point that, uh, you know, this is all for, uh, personal speech and I'm not representing my employer uh, or any of my employers, you know, figured I'd throw that in there. And yeah, I mean, I, I think really when, when NIL came to the forefront, when NIL was, was, was finally allowed or, you know, forced to be allowed uh, by the NCAA when sufficient pressure by, you know, multiple entities was put on the NCAA to allow uh, college athletes to, to profit off the NIL. The way that they did it was really, really interesting and in, in very kind of a key way because I, I think all of us kind of on, on, you know, not only on this panel, but in the audience kind of see the NCAA as being very much in certain ways, especially for kind of broader regulatory authority, being very kind of, you know, very trying to be very consistent, trying to protect it, or really ensure that, you know, things are applied you know, whether they actually follow through on this or not is a different question, but trying to make things, making sure that things are applied certain in certain ways, even handily across the university. So for a long period of time, for a long stretch of time, they had sought to have their own kind of national NIL restrictions. But then Alston came out on June 21st, 2021, and you had a bunch of state laws uh, that were scheduled to come in effect in on July 1st, 2021. So that didn't give the NCAA a whole lot of time to react to Alston. Uh, they had previously, you know, proposed certain things. The Department of Justice had come in and said, hey, you know, those, those restrictions that you want to put on NAL are probably illegal under the antitrust laws. And that was before Alston, which stripped the NCAA of all of its, essentially all of its legal protections on the antitrust laws, or potentially did at least. We'll, we'll definitely see how that plays out. So the NCAA decided to in a certain sense, kind of throw its hands up and say, you know what, we're not going to be able to control this, especially not in 10 days. We're going to pass some interim restrictions, some interim regulations on NIL. We're going to allow NIL, we're going to allow this to happen. We're going to have a few really kind of guidelines, which uh, we're, I think we're seeing, you know, day after day are increasingly guidelines rather than firm rules, at least until the NCAA actually acts on them. But beyond that, beyond really recruiting based restrictions, like they have to have a quid pro quo. Uh, they can't be contingent on enrollment at a particular school. But beyond these recruiting-based restrictions, the NCAA has given member institutions and states who have passed state NIL laws pretty much free reign to regulate athlete NIL. And you have a lot of these states, you have you know, about two dozen states that have passed legislation uh, that have allowed, the, the essentially were designed to force schools within the state to allow for, NIL, for athlete NIL, but do also place some restrictions on that NIL usage. We're also seeing other states, uh, it's kind of a funny kind of uh, way it worked out with the NCAA like, doing what they did, where um, you're seeing certain states like Alabama uh, that are actually repealing their NIL laws because they actually are more restrictive than the, the status quo, more restrictive than doing nothing, which is kind of an interesting paradigm here and shows that a lot of these state laws, a lot of these institutional policies kind of filtering down in some cases, have some restrictions, have some interesting restrictions, important restrictions on name, image, and likeness. But here's the thing, and this is what uh, Neil, uh, Dr. Shrenos and I explored in our paper that, uh, that Sandy alluded to, NIL is speech when an athlete goes on social media to promote a company, when an athlete appears in a commercial, when an athlete really does anything, he makes an appearance, a lot of the times, not all of the times, it's really a lot of times can be dependent on the particular NIL agreement, but a lot of the times it's going to be speech. It's going to be something that is, you know, a certain type of speech that's going to be regu now regulated by the schools and by the states through state law. And when you have public colleges and universities, when you have state legislatures that are imposing compulsory restraints saying schools must restrict NIL in these certain cases, well, that creates a First Amendment issue because you're all of a sudden regulating athlete NIL speech. 
And it, there's an interesting discussion here about like for, for private universities, for example, about when, you know, if you have a, uh, a state law that says, well, you can regulate that speech, Supreme Court opinion, when it says you can, when it's kind of a permissive uh, restriction like that, you, you know, the private university can regulate the speech. It's probably not going to be affected by the First Amendment. But sometimes you do have these compulsory restraints where states are saying you have to regulate speech in a certain way. You have to regulate NIL in this certain way. And it's creating, as, as Neil and I explored, it cr creates a very interesting, very uh, important issue that I don't think athletic departments, I don't think universities, I don't think the state legislatures really thought about as they were passing these restrictions, but one that could potentially come to the forefront, you know, very, very quickly. So in our paper, Neil and I explored really generally three different types, three different categories of NIL restrictions that we're seeing pretty repeatedly across various state NIL laws, across very various uh, institutional policies. Um, California, the very first, uh, the Fair Pay to Play, Pay, Fair Pay to Play Act um, had this restriction uh, that was kind of put into place uh, later, um, you know, a, 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 as an amendment that prohibited athletes from signing deals with companies that compete with school scholarship deals, saying athletes can't sign deals that conflict with their contracts, that, that conflict with their, with their contracts. And the way that's been interpreted, the way that's been seen by schools is that if there's, but Boise State, for example, my employer is a Nike institution. If a Boise State athlete, if this restraint applies, which I'm not sure Boise State has this restraint actually, but you know, just for the sake of argument, if an athlete wanted to sign a deal with Adidas, for example, they would not be able to do so because it would conflict with a Nike sponsorship under that interpretation of the state law. Second category, you also see prohibitions on athletes signing deals with what we deem vice industries, uh, alcohol companies, tobacco companies, gambling companies, pornography companies. Uh, and then this really goes back to uh, well, really what Joe was saying, really what Frank was saying as well. It's speech that we don't like. It's speech the university likes. And it's also speech that is really just based on reputation. So just all the justifications for these restrictions are based on reputation. We want to protect our reputation. We don't want to have an athlete at our school signing a deal to you know, have their name, image, and likeness in pornos, because that would look bad for the institution, even if they're not wearing our colors, even if they're not wearing our logos. So that's why these restrictions are in place. And finally, there's a, a few of these restrictions, particularly in state laws, Mississippi's, uh, Mississippi state law is particularly egregious in, the, in this matter, that actually broadly, broadly prohibits athletes signing any kind of deals that otherwise conflict with institutional values. And institutional values, I'm going to put that in quotes because it doesn't define what institutional values are. It's, uh, it's, it says, really, we're going to protect the institutional reputation by indirectly forbidding deals with certain disfavored industries or products. We're going beyond saying, you know, gambling companies, tobacco companies, pornography companies. We're going to go beyond that and say, whatever the university deems to be against their institutional values, athletes can't enter into those kind of deals. Like, I'll quote the exact language from Mississippi statutes. It says, um, athletes can't enter into NIL deals with any other product or service that is reasonably considered to be inconsistent with the values or missions of a post-secondary educational institution or that negatively impacts or reflects adversely on a post-secondary education institution or its athletic programs, including without limitation, bring about public disrepute, embarrassment, scandal, ridicule, or otherwise negatively impacting the reputation or the moral or ethical standards of the post-secondary educational institution. That's fairly broad. That's incredibly broad. That's really a situation where anything the, the universe, as I was saying before, anything the university says is against our institutional values, whatever we deem those institutional values to be on a post hoc basis, we can strike down that deal. And really, what we explored in this article uh, is really just looking at this, you know, first off, as, as Sandy alluded to, a lot of these NIL deals would absolutely be considered commercial speech. I think most of them would because, you know, if you're entering into an NIL deal, most of the time you're going to be doing so to promote a product or service, classic commercial speech. But as Frank was talking about, Frank, Frank summarized the overbreath doctrine absolutely beautifully here. And it applies here as well because overbreath, as, as Frank said, is, is always fatal to speech restrictions. And here you have a lot of overbreath. You have a whole lot of overbreath because think about for example, let's say that um, an athlete in Mississippi who is under the state law, uh, which you know by 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 no by there's no question that it's going to be something that's that's 
that, that's a public restriction, that is a state restriction. Let's say that athlete wants to appear in a commercial, wants to be paid to appear in a commercial supporting or against abortion rights. Well, Mississippi may not want them to do that. Mississippi may say this is against our institutional values. Or, you know, as, as Kaya was talking about, we have these situations, you know, we have kneeling as a big thing. What if there wants to be a commercial regarding Kaya's kneeling or another athlete's kneeling for the, for the national anthem? You see that and you see Nike doing cut stuff like that all the time. That could also lend into the competing sponsorship thing where you're seeing really a lot of times these restrictions being made where the looking at the text of the policy, not looking at the interpretation of the policy, not looking at how the policy is going to be applied, necessarily going to be applied, but from the text of the policy, you, these universities can, can, can bar speech regardless of political value. And courts have been really strong in saying that that is overbroad. When, you, when you're impacting political speech, it's going to be overbroad. And the Supreme Court has said, said in U.S. v. Stevens, First Amendment protects against the government. It does not leave us at the mercy of noblesse obliged. We would not uphold an unconstitutional statute merely because the government promised to use it responsibly. So you have these statutes that are overbroad. You can argue that the colleges would say, oh, we would never, never, you know, restrict an athlete's political speech. But the fact that they can under these statutory authorities, the fact that they can under these institutional policies as well, really creates a big problem for athletes' free speech rights. And I am quite a bit over the five minutes that I was assigned to, but I think everyone well, was, so I will we, leave it there. Thank you very much. We don't, we don't have a, a, a lot of questions, but I, I have one quick question for you to follow up, and that is that uh, since different states uh, decide with regard to these so-called vice uh, industries, whether they're going to restrict uh, NIL licensing with respect to those, uh, isn't that going to enter into recruiting wars and athletes being uh, enjoy, uh, invited to come to some states where there are no such restrictions? And oh, absolutely. And I think, you're, I think you're already seeing that. I mean, I mentioned earlier in the presentation about Alabama repealing their NIL law because they found it to be more restrictive than not. I mean, here, here at Boise State, um, you know, the athletic department at my university, and again, I'm not speaking on behalf of them, but just using them as an example, They've boasted that they have the least restrictive NIL restrictions uh, in the country. And whether that's true or not is, is up for debate. But the, the, I think one of the big reasons why is that Idaho does not have, never has had any kind of NIL law. So you're, you're starting to see the states kind of wake up to this and out completely outside of the First Amendment issue say, hey, maybe we should not have these restrictions because it's actually going to hurt our, our athletes' recruiting efforts, particularly as we see more and more, you know, vice, vice industries, gambling is listed among them, many of these statutes, especially as we're seeing more and more kind of gambling influence within sports. I mean, Colorado State has their own gambling deal. Oh, thanks very much. Um, we do have one question from a fellow member of the great board of directors, Carl Itzvog, who asked, why isn't the press doing its job? Why is the press playing cheerleader for college sports? Why aren't student journalists questioning athletic directors and presidents? So anyone want to take that on? Joe, Joe has a hand up. Did you want to answer that first or else? No, I, was, I wanted to comment on something that Sam said. Um, actually, two. One, I do think that the, um, the uh, institutional reputation kinds of statutes are are overbroad reach out, but I do think that there's an interest in universities besides reputations. Uh, in, in, a collegiate academic institutions do have a purpose, and I think it's one of the things that athletics has, has undermined in ways, do have a purpose with regard to the, uh, the kind of message, the kind of institution they wanna run. And I do think once you move to pornography and you're moving more in that direction, I think you're sitting in areas where I think a university does have a right maybe to say something. The other comment I wanted to make is the NCAA is out of this area right now in large part because it couldn't do anything quickly and it didn't get ahead of the problem when it should have. Uh, but uh, the devolving to divisional control was the other reason for stepping back. What the NCAA has, a has done is said, we can't handle this on an all division basis anymore. There's too much diversity. So we're gonna leave it to the divisions to do. And so it is certainly possible, maybe likely that within division one where the major programs are, that something will be put in place. Um, there is no question that you've got to have with regulation of a national entity, 
the, the major fundamental regulatory uh, uh, rules have to be applied to everybody, that you cannot have this pick and choose. So I thought that was my comment. Thanks, Frank. Uh, Frank, since you uh, headed a student journalism uh, program for a while, can you uh, respond to Carl's question about student journalists and why the press isn't uh, on this more? Yeah, I, I will try. I mean, I, I have a couple of theories here. Theory number one is, I, I think because journalists have just been conditioned through decades of experience that these policies are normal, that they really don't think to push back and challenge them, even though we know that there's a vast, vast disconnect between what the law says, what the Constitution says, and what these institutions are actually doing. And I think the moment any of these policies got into court, it would fold like a cheap suit. But because news organizations, you know, A, don't have the resources to sue themselves, and, and, and B, have just been conditioned through years of experience that this is the way business is done, that, that they just don't think that there's anything abnormal about it. And the other is that, you know, journalists are, are always preached to don't go whining to the public about inside baseball things that primarily concern you, right? Write about things that are salient to your audience, write about the problems that they're having in their lives. And I think a lot of journalists probably look at, well, I'm not going to spend a lot of my, my bandwidth writing and broadcasting about a policy that primarily inconveniences me. That's not what my audience cares about. They don't want to listen to me belly aching about how hard it is to do my job. So I think those two things, I disagree with that. I mean, I think this is a speaker problem. It's not a journalist problem. I think that the fact that, you know, people at University of Maryland didn't feel like they could call out safety conditions is not a journalism problem. That's a safety problem. But I do think that's what's behind a lot of it, you know. And, and by the way, I mean, I think the third reason is that actually journalists have written about this stuff and nothing changes, you know. And once you write the story and nothing changes, then I think that that, that greatly disincentivizes you to continue writing about it. <laughs> uh, thanks, Frank. I, I uh, wanted to... Uh uh mentioned to people um, watching this video that the Drake group actually is uh, has is uh, inaugurating a new award for uh, student journalism investigative journalism in this area so so we will actually be promoting <laughs> students getting more involved in the kind of work we would like to see done by uh, journalists in general so that's a that's a plus um, we have another uh, uh, question from, uh, from Alan Sack himself, who asks, could a famous college athlete take a job modeling in the summer without mentioning his athletic background and, uh, and, and uh, do that with, 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 uh, without violating anything? Well, if I can try this, at least to start, right now there isn't anything much to violate. Uh, would depend on what the rules that are say that are put in place. But certainly to the extent that there is more distancing between the institution and the athlete's speech, the more likely it will be upheld uh, because you're not gonna have any argument that the athlete is speaking for the school, endorsed by the school, promoted by the school. So that every, every step that distances from that argument is a step that I think argues for upholding what might otherwise be a particular activity by an athlete that otherwise might be more challengeable. Yeah, I, I haven't seen any kind of restrictions okay, that, um, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen any kind of restrictions that would necessarily uh, directly um, you know, bar athletes from, from modeling in the, over the summer. Um, you know, that might be something that, you know, a school in Mississippi under the, that state statute might say or could be deemed to potentially say would be against their institutional values. Not sure I see that. Not sure they want to, you know, necessarily cross that bridge. Um, so I don't, I don't think that, I, I think that under, at least under the institutional policies I've seen um, and the state, the state laws that I've seen wouldn't follow any of them. But, you know, as Joe said, it would be very much dependent. I also do want to mention kind of the irony there because that's exactly what uh, Jeremy Bloom's pseudo uh, over back in, uh, you know, back in the early 2000s and he wasn't allowed to do it, but now he would be allowed to do it. So, you know, shout out to him. Thank you. Uh, I have a question here from uh, Jack Seltzer from Penn State University. 
Uh, he uh, he says that it looks as though that there are some restrictions on free speech that uh, are legally okay for athletes, but the trick is to know exactly where to draw on the line. For example, I was very heartened by Colin Kaepernick's protest of the national anthem uh, and, until somebody asked me if NFL players should be allowed to display the Confederate flag. Or another thing that occurs to me in terms of NIL is what happens when political candidates want to buy endorsements by college or pro athletes. Can football players display or express uh, support for Joe Biden or Donald Trump? I guess my question for all is where would each of you draw the line? Anybody want to take that on? <laughs> so, so I can start by addressing the uh, can football players display or express support for, for Joe Biden or Donald Trump, uh, kind of the, the paid endorsement by, um, by, by political figures, by political candidates. And that's actually something that, uh, that Neil and I talk about in this paper explicitly because it's, again, another reason why this Mississippi statute, for example, might be or should certainly be deemed as overbroad. And while, again, you know, that's Mississippi, that's one state statute, you, you don't see a whole lot of them that are that bad, but you can, you're, you're certain, I, I'm, I'm sure you would see some outcry, some, some really, some, some key kind of conflicts there if you did start to see athletes endorsing political candidates, even if they didn't, again, you know, it's, use the university colors to do so, use university tr trademarks to do so. Um, but that might lead to further temptation for restriction, um, not only showing that this Mississippi statute is overbroad, but that's that's certainly a, uh, an area where I, I feel like universities don't really have uh, or should not have bounds to, uh, to, 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 to go against this, to forbid this. So that, that's a key area there. That political speech area right there is a key one where Certainly, that should be allowed. That should be allowed on our NIL. I would really like to hear Kaya say where she thinks the rules should be. I would like to hear that from her. I'm just going to say one thing about in First Amendment land. Um, while there is not a super well-developed body of precedent about athletes, there's a pretty well-developed body of precedent that I might analogize to in public employment with things like school teachers in the classroom, right? And when you're in the classroom, so if you had a... Uh, uh, elect Joe Biden button on your lapel and you wanted to wear that all over town and you wanted to wear it, you know, 24 and a half hours out of your uh, 23 and a half hours out of your life. You're completely welcome to do that. And your public employer absolutely cannot stop you. But for the 30 minutes that you're standing in front of the class, actually discharging the job for which you are being paid at that point, the employer actually can say, you know what, take that button off because now you're a message board for the institution when you're standing up there delivering the lecture that you're being paid to do. So I think the closest analogy would be and where I would pre predict the courts would come down is that they would say, yeah, you know what, if you want to put the sticker on your football helmet, they can tell you to take it off because at that point, you're actually, you know, you're, you're altering the look of the uniform, which, you know, you, you agree to wear that uniform as a condition of the benefits that you receive. But if you're not altering the look of the uniform, if you want to wear it walking around campus the rest of the time, institution ought not be able to touch you or put it in your Twitter profile. I, I, I want to hear from Kaya also, but let me interject here that there are statutes that limit the ability of employees of public institutions to engage in political activity during an election year, and they have been upheld as constitutional. So I don't know that I would say the student can't do it, and I certainly as a matter of policy would, would not say that, but uh, the, the, the Hatch Act which does limit the political opportunity of employees of government uh, entities during election years with regard to political activity is constitutional. I think there is a case, I think there is a case in Florida now where a teacher wore a rainbow pad <coughs> in class. And I think by belief she was fired and uh, she claims that she was just expressing support generally for uh, LGBTQ people who are under attack in Florida. Now, we don't know how that case will come out, but we'll see. So Kyle, let's hear from you. <laughs> yeah, no, this is um, this webinar and just all the background reading has brought up a lot of um, 
mixed thoughts in my head just knowing what I have done have experienced and what my friends haven't done experience one of the articles sent in the chat or in the chat actually featured two of my really close friends so um it's definitely interesting coming from an athlete's perspective and it makes me really excited for law school to sort of deal with the legal side of it I will say from my own like moral side of it to me the line is drawn at like hate speech in my head um, and I, I know that that <laughs> may be very loosely defined depending on who you ask, but, um, to me that, that line is drawn with hate speech. I mean, I, I get, I get how the argument might be made that, you know, if somebody can kneel, then what's to stop people from doing Confederate, um, flags as some sort of protest. I get it. I understand it from that perspective, but coming purely from, you know, somebody that has like a, a moral standing in the activist space, I guess. I I would draw the line at hate speech. Um, I've definitely dealt with people who have had differing political beliefs to me quite often in the sports space. And I recognize the, the right to free speech, but it also um, I've been on the other side of it where I have been harmed by certain policies and lack of policies that were put in place um, that affected my identities as like a woman, affected my identities as a black woman, um, specifically in my sport as well. So that's my moral line. I don't have an opinion about the legal line just yet, but get back to me in three years. There was an interesting case, I think, discussed in one of the articles, maybe uh, by one of the professors. Um, about a coach who was fired for using the N-word. And it turns out that I think five of the basketball players on his team came forward to say that they had no problem with his using the N-word. So for them, actually, it didn't constitute hate speech and they had no objection to it. And then there's, then there's trash talking. And what happens if the N-word is used in trash talking between Black athletes and not between athletes of, of different races. Um, that, that may put it then in the different context. So I think, again, it sort of shows how very much fact specific these cases can get so that one generally thinks of the use of the N-word as something that you, know, you really should steer clear of, but there are even circumstances where it appears that that is okay. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the case you're referring to, that was, uh, uh, that was something cited in uh, my article. Um, uh, uh, the, it was a Dambron case, Dambron v. Central Michigan University out of the Sixth Circuit. Really, really interesting case for, you know, saying just like you said, it's a situation where the coach used the N-word, but he actually had asked for permission from the athletes whether he could do it first, which is kind of an interesting thing. And that, that the case dealt with overbreath in terms of, um, you know, a lot of what Kai was saying were, were how do you exactly define hate speech? How do you define uh, harassment via speech, um, discriminatory speech? And it's, it's really, really difficult to do. Um, so from, from a legal perspective, as far as where to draw the line, I would echo exactly what Frank, speak, Frank said, which is really talking about it in terms of time, place, and manner, talking about it where, yeah, maybe you can't wear a, a, a Joe Biden sticker on your helmet at, at the football field, um, but, um, or a Donald Trump sticker on, on your helmet on the football field. But when they're walking around campus, when they're on social media, and especially you know, after the Mahonoi case, uh, we saw the other Supreme, the other interesting sports Supreme Court case from last year. You're really seeing the Supreme Court being very receptive to have students having rights, having a lot more rights, especially for off-campus speech, and that's something where NIL should certainly apply as well. So I have a question relating to the uh, the cases we discussed in the uh, Drake uh, paper on on this subject, and that is. Uh, I, I wouldn't characterize what the men team members said about the women team members as hate speech. I don't think they could be construed as really hating the, the, the members of the women's team at all, but they were clearly using language which was disrespectful and you know nasty in all sorts of ways. So my question to you is, had that occurred in a public university context, do you think that the actions taken by the athletic department in canceling the season would have held up had it been challenged legally.
it's it's clearly offensive speech, but you know the Supreme Court is okay with offensive speech, and uh, so you know, <laughs> I, I'm not really sure myself. I don't have any any sense of how that might have come out. You know, <laughs> it's really locker room humor of the of the Trump kind that was you know revealed in his Hollywood Texas tape. Um, but uh, maybe that's maybe that's okay with the Supreme Court and strict scrutiny. I don't know. I, I don't know if this is necessarily a doctrinally perfect answer or not, but not that much in this area is doctrinally perfect. And so I would predict that where I would forecast the courts coming out, if this was say, you know, whatever University of North Carolina or sort of Iowa public university, is they would look at that reaction which was to cancel games, right? And they would say, well, look, this didn't deprive you of the ability to sleep in the dorm or attend classes or eat the meal plan or do any of the other benefits that you bargained for in exchange for becoming an athlete. It may have deprived the fans of the ability to go to some games, but this may not be a sufficiently adverse action as to you that it triggers any particular First Amendment uh, right for yourself, right? Now, I, we could have three hours of discussion about this because it's all sorts of, right, First Amendment doctrine that says anything that is meant to chill and inhibit speech can be enough. But I do think that, you know, uh, judges, particularly in this area, like to take the easy off ramps to be able to dodge the hard questions. And I think that's a very easy off ramp to be able to say, look, you know what, they canceled three games. That's not an adverse reaction directed to you. You, you got nothing. You're muted. Uh, let, let's circle back to the question of employment uh, now, because both uh, you, Frank, and, and Sam addressed the question of what happens when athletes become regarded as employees, uh, maybe just in the revenue producing sports, maybe across the board. How does that alter the, the uh, handling of these free speech questions? Frank, you want to start that? I will. I'm multitasking because I'm trying to answer Jim in the chat. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, let, let me take a crack because I actually did a research paper that came out in January about this question. And the people with long memories will remember, right, back in 2014, there was a complaint filed with the NLRB on behalf of Northwestern football players attempting to designate football players at Northwestern and, and other big division one programs that make money, right? As employees for purposes of National Labor Relations Act. And the NLRB has been on this roller coaster ride, depending on who is in charge of it, as to what they think about this question or not. And the most recent iteration of guidance from counsel at the board, not from the board, but from the board's chief legal counsel, is we do think that if you are a player at a private institution and in a revenue generating sport, that that looks like employment, meaning that all of the rights that the NLRA confers uh, uh, belong to you as well. Importantly, that includes quite a lot of free speech rights, including that the NLRB has said that if you are at an NLRA regulated institution and your employer is telling you don't go on social media and talk about your work or don't talk to the press about your work, that's an unfair labor practice and it's a violation of federal law. And so I, I think the state of the law today is that, by the way, after Northwestern got in the crosshairs, they did go back and they completely rewrote their athlete handbook. And it is now model. It's an optimal handbook because it doesn't speak in terms of don't, don't, don't. It speaks in terms of best practices and we're here to help you. And, and it's actually quite a good handbook now. Um, but ironically, I think the law might be clearer in the private sector than it is in the public sector because we have this vast body of NLRB authority and the NLRB only regulates the private sector, right? These two things are mutually exclusive. So you're in the public sector, you get the First Amendment. You're in the private sector, you get the NLRA. Period. So I, I think the state of the law today is best understood that, yeah, you know, uh, a, a public university, at least a, you know, a big one in a, in a revenue generating sport can't tell their athletes stay off social media or, or don't talk to the press. Thanks, Frank. Uh, it occurred to me uh, coming from my copyright background that there might be some intellectual property questions involved here in the sense that uh, we know that uh, faculty produce patentable products and those patents, the, the revenues from those patents are shared by universities and faculties and their departments. 
usually there's a, a standard kind of percentage of 40, 20, 20, something like that in, in that arrangement. Um, on the other hand, universities do not try to uh, benefit from the revenue produced by books that are written by faculty members, even though strictly speaking, faculty are considered to be employees, of course, but they are simply not considered traditionally to be employees for the purpose of publication of books. So, so copyrights and, and patents are treated differently in universities. I was wondering if uh, NL, NILs come into play in the revenue producing sports, if universities might try to work out contractual arrangements to share in some of that income. And I got a response, I forget from who now, who said, oh, well, that will just start uh, being put into the recruiting equation and those universities will tell recruitable athletes that no, we're not gonna attempt to take any part of your NIL licensing money and therefore you should come to our school instead of others. So that may, that may undercut that whole discussion. Uh, Sam, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, I'm pretty sure uh, if I remember correctly, that's that, that's something I brought up. Um, and I definitely still feel that way where, you know, it's <laughs> yes, I, yes, it could be something that universities could put into the contracts into, um, you know, kind of the signing contracts that athletes are going to sign with the universities to say, you know, hey, we control a certain percentage of your NIL income. I don't think they would do that simply because of competitive issues um, and, you know, it would certainly provoke a, a huge outcry, uh, especially if it was kind of hidden in the contract and something that kind of arose later where you're, you know, putting something in the middle of a contract that an 18 year old is signing that they, you know, get all this NIL income. It would probably be probably bad. I mean, legally, could they do it under contractual rights? Sure. Will they do it? Almost certainly not. And um, I, I do think there's a distinction here between uh, you know, faculty members producing um, pr producing certain things uh, like patents, for example, because th that's a much clearer application of the work made for hire doctrine, where you're actually being hired to perform that specific task. Athletes are being hired to play sports. They're not being hired to do NIL. So I, I think there's a pretty clear distinction there. Okay, we have about five minutes left. Uh, anyone want to come in with some final thoughts on anything we discussed? <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. I was going to type an answer to Bruce Smith, but I won't type it, I'll just say it, which is um, Bruce was asking, which is a, a great question, um, how can we get information about free speech rights into the hands of the athletes, especially since the athletic departments are certainly not going to do it. Um, and I think that's where, you know, people like, um, you know, Kaya that are, you know, opinion leaders have a good platform, uh, uh, probably have a way bigger following on social media than I do, um, can, be, uh, can be influences here, if I can use the contemporary term. You know, there's great organizations like Ramogi Humas and CPA that, uh, you know, that, that have a megaphone that can reach a lot of athletes, but I really think that we are about to enter into a period of much greater professionalism of organizing of athletes of all kinds now that we have NIL, right? Now that there's money involved, you're going to see, you know, athletes and advocates really getting into the act. And I think these speech restrictions invariably are going to fall like dominoes because they have to, they have to fall because you can't have an effective NIL system, right? That says you are welcome to sell your name to Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola or Nike. However, don't talk to anybody without our permission, right? I mean, one doesn't make sense without the other. And so I think invariably those dominoes are gonna fall very quickly. I see uh, uh, Kai has hand up. Yeah, I was just gonna follow up on that just from the athlete perspective and somebody who lived in the, the actual system of the NCAA before NIL. It's very, very restrictive. I couldn't do interviews without the permission of my athletic department. They had to go through them. And I luckily had an athletic department that enabled me to kneel in the first place. Um, but I will say, I think it's very clear based on where we are now that college athletes are very, very hard to organize. And I will say, in my opinion, it's just because they don't know. It took me being outside the realm of college athletics to even become informed about these issues and it took me seeking out information and talking to experts about it to even learn the extent that I know now and it's still a long way to go and I think 
you know, it's one of the most significant factors is the fact that if we're going to call it a labor for a force, the labor force is recycled every four to five years. And so I think it really does take athletes who existed in that system to come back and, you know, communicate that because as much as I really want athletes to listen to experts, like everybody on this panel, they're going to listen to athletes more. Um, and that's just how it is. So yeah, no, it's, there's a lot of ways that I think can be improved upon um, for giving this information to athletes, but there is, um, I think the primary way is going to be through athletes like myself or professional athletes who have been through the system. Yeah, if I can add, I do think athletics departments are trying. I think the, the picture that they're not trying at all to inform is probably a little jaundiced, at least at a lot of institutions. Um, but, and, and you know, the NCAA a few years ago uh, adopted rules that had student athlete voice in the major legislative groups in the NCAA. But those students tended, at least in some of the conferences in particular, to really pretty much mirror the positions of the schools in those conferences. Um, and you know, I was part of efforts to, to inform students on bylaws and what they would mean. That's a hard hill to climb. Students are in school, they've got their education, they want to play, they don't want to be distracted by other things. I think I'm describing accurately. Um, the, the time that they have or the interest that they have in doing other things, I mean, their kids, um, is not great. And that effort to try to get them to see the world more broadly and see pictures beyond the, I want to play tomorrow, is I think really difficult. Now, I don't want to say it can't happen, but boy, I think it's a difficult you know, run to do it. And I think Kai is right, it's former athletes that will have more impact there. But still, you're talking about a you know, student market, uh, even at Northwestern, when they ended up having to vote for the union, they didn't, um, they want to play. And you know, even if a school is clear that there will be no repercussions, and even if the school means it, I don't know that that's a message that, that's going to get through to athletes who's crying they're there because they want to play, and that's what they want to do, and anything that gets in the way um, is going to be difficult to for anybody who's advising them to get around. So, Kaya, you should have the last word on this, but that's my picture having worked with athletes for many years. Well, we, we've actually run out of time. Uh, I do apologize to Jim Perry for missing his question, but we'll answer that in the follow-up. And I want to thank all of you panelists for this very interesting discussion. I keep learning more and more myself about this area. So I benefited too, as I hope did the, uh, the viewers out there. And uh, we, we uh, appreciate your patience in, in all of this discussion. And uh, we will uh, part ways now and have a good day.